Yeah, so Eurythmics Touch from 81 and Human League's Dare from, you said, 83, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will be doing the Eurythmics albums uh, first. Um, we have not covered uh, the Eurythmics. Uh, we actually haven't covered either band no. um, on the podcast, so we haven't given really any um, biography. So I, I'll try to do a quick bio of um, the Eurythmics here. They're, they're a duo. Um, that was formed in 1980. It is Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart, who are creative partners and also were romantic partners for um, a, a good amount of the time that they're together um, in the Eurythmics. Uh, they okay. were previously in a band called The Tourists. Um, first album was in 81. Um, does not have a ton of success, but then their second album, um, Sweet Dreams Are Made of These, is released in 1983 and becomes a huge hit. And so the Eurythmics uh, become the Eurythmics at that part, at that point. And then later in the year, they released this one, Touch. So this is actually the second album of 1983 uh, that uh, was uh, released by the Eurythmics in that year, which is pretty incredible. Um, Lennox and Stewart first met in 1975 in a restaurant where uh, Lennox is working, which I found to be absolutely hilarious, didn't you? Because literally <laughs> she's working in a, in a, as a waitress, right? Yeah. But not at a cocktail bar, but that's not their song, right? That's the Human <laughs> right. League song on the other album. So yeah. there's a lot of like hilarious things that happen this week and overlap where I'm like, wow, the story of how Lennox and Stuart Meat is literally the, the plot to some degree of the biggest Human League song on the other album we cover. Yeah, credit, so. credit to you for these pairings because I thought there was a, they were very good and um, a lot to compare and contrast to. So, Well, good. Um, Thank I you. That. I appreciate yeah. that. So, um, so they're playing together in a variety of bands. They're in a punk band called The Catch. They're in The Taurus and stuff. And then they finally decide to break off after they were playing around with a portable mini synthesizer um, and they decide to sort of ride, uh, wide, uh, excuse me, ride that wave together. Um, they're called the Eurythmics. Do you, do you have any idea where that name comes from, Josh? I thought this was interesting. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah. So it was named after a pedagogical exercise system. <laughs> okay that oh, <laughs> Lennox had run into as a child. So it was called the Eurythmic. Uh, uh, Dalcro's Eurythmics uh, is sometimes simplified to Eurythmics was the name. And it was used mm. to teach music to students, but it was a peda pedagogical system. Um, good, and, good name, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and it can be everything and nothing at the same time, <laughs> yeah. can it? Which is like yeah. kind of what's going on there. Um, they decided to be uh, two together, but they had a philosophy, which I found very funny, Josh. They decided to involve others in the collaboration, quote, on the basis of mutual compatibility and availability, <laughs> <laughs> so, which is a good uh, way to live life, I think. You know what I mean? Yeah. Availability and compatibility. Good. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of the story of this podcast, isn't it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the duo signs at RCA Records. Um, and then they split as a couple. So they actually split as a couple uh, as they were starting the Eurythmics, which I thought was interesting. Mm. Um, so they had been a couple, but by the time they're here, uh, they are not a couple, at least in terms of the research uh, that I did. So they do their first album, In the Garden, um, with Connie Plank. You probably remember him from way back when. Do you remember um, his influence? Oh, man, that name does sound familiar, but I don't remember. Yeah, we were we were educated by my my buddy Jeff on the Noi album. Noi. He was, yeah, he, was yeah. he was the man in the Krautrock uh, scene. Um, tied in quite a bit with Kraftwerk and Noi and sort of like the 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 I, I was going to say evil mastermind, but he wasn't evil. He was like the mastermind right behind mm -hmm. some of that stuff, the production. Um, so shout out to my friend Jeff who kind of walked us through that on the Noi uh, episode way back when. But um, they that album uh, had kraut rock leanings as you'd imagine mm -hmm. and psychedelia and electro pop uh and also had some interesting people on it two members of can were on that album uh, as well as clem burke uh the drummer of blondie was oh, wow. on that one as well um and the album did not sell very uh, well the highest tracking song uh, got to number 63 on the uk charts and um they toured behind it 
and they decide to get a bank loan and make a eight track uh, studio to record their second one. They end up recording a bunch of tracks. It's a really hard recording session. And Annie Lennox um, has a nervous breakdown during it. And, and Stuart gets a, Dave Stewart gets a collapsed lung. So there's all kinds of stuff. But yeah. they release the album and then uh, the album hits huge. Uh, the, the title track, Sweet Dreams Are Made of These, becomes a hit on both sides of the Atlantic. It's number two on the UK singles chart and tops both the Canadian and US Billboard Hot 100. So from that moment, uh, they are big stars. Annie Lennox starts to become sort of the, the face of the band, I'd say, in terms of the vision or the um, the the look. aesthetics, right, yeah, yeah. of the, uh, the the look of the band because of the, the music videos and stuff like that. And then they, uh, they released this album uh, the same year and it hits number one on the album charts uh, in the UK and has multiple um, huge hits. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Dave Stewart, um, you know, isn't sort of like the, uh, the creative force in certain elements in terms of the choices of music and some of the visuals and stuff. But Annie Lennox is a huge part of that right because she's often carrying out the the vision right yep. but during mm -hmm. that time they have cameos and actually um during one of those uh stuart meets his future wife uh shaban fahey who was in the uh the group bananarama uh, hmm. along the way so yeah that's a little bit of an element of what's going on there but definitely this is one of those bands as is the other band that we'll cover in this that was helped quite a bit by mtv they are yeah. an mtv band in the early uh, era of mtv so that sets the table a little bit josh what'd you think of this one? Oh man i am i'm really glad we listened to this album i thought this was a, a very good to great album um in, in terms of the music and and the sound of it uh the her voice is so she's kind of the star of of Eurythmics in terms of the sound or voice is the highlight but this album has so much going on in terms of different musical styles that it's incorporating there's a lot of a um, there's you know everything from from funk and, um, and yeah like the first cut is super funky yeah yep and then the uh, uh, you know the electronics come into play as well um, electronic music like on pain a rumor but that also has some funky guitar and then you have something like like steel drum and caribbean sounds on right by your side and there's even some kind of like i would say uh you know like um, not blue-eyed soul but definitely some like r b influences maybe and there's just so much like kind of layering of sounds and um you know the synth is on here but it's not really like the dominant thing that that comes to mind when listening to the band um you know in comparison to like sweet dreams are made of these like that has a it's like a strong you know dominant synth beat to it but this kind of varies from track to track and you know almost into this album is creative in a way that that like the talking heads albums were creative there are just so that's, many kind of that's a point I wrote down too that it's it's in many ways like a Talking Heads album. Yeah, yeah, it's it's remarkable in terms of kind of the variety and the originality and the way that they incorporate things and and her voice kind of anchoring it all and she has this kind of you know like I don't know you know deeper I would say deeper female voice um, uh, register than than some other bands and that kind of adds this you know like mysterious or kind of you know velvety her voice is very velvety and like um, well and and sultry i guess too in a way. would you say because you're saying she's the standout but to me um it's such a clear contrast between her voice and like the music behind it which is a much more synthy colder style of music and then yeah her vocals are more lively, I'd say. So they kind of play off each other. That's what I think makes her vocals stand out even more to me. That I don't think they'd stand out without the the musical choices behind them, for me at least. No, that, you know, no, that's a good point. Yeah, that I guess that's what I'm saying or trying to say is that she 
she really just kind of yeah the, the her voice is so kind of soulful and and uh and velvety that is contrasted by kind of the music that's going on but um yeah this was a, a real pleasure to listen to there was no no um weak tracks on the album some of the songs were were slightly long but something like no fear no hate no pain no broken hearts which is the second to last track is kind of is really like a dance track almost and um, has a repeating that repeating refrain um, in the chorus and throughout the album and um, there's a real groove to this uh, album as well as just kind of a variety that i really appreciated yeah this as a, as a synthetic um music goes which hasn't always been my favorite type of music this is the style that i like the, yeah. the choices and um i love the fact that it doesn't rely as much on the consistent monotony um even though there's in that way it's like very good kraut rock mm -hmm. in that there's a at times it goes into what the synth has the electronic and the the coldness of the synth right and the metronomic yep. tendencies but it doesn't stay there and it's layered over top of it and sometimes there's multiple things doing that but one being a steady lower one and then another being a higher sort of more jarring one and then yeah then you have um annie lennox kind of playing the role of like almost like a kate bush type presence on it where she's you know sometimes high sometimes lower register sometimes exuberant sometimes more sultry in mm -hmm. terms of how she's singing um so it, it, what i can say about this album that i like so much is it keeps you off balance but in the best way possible and that's where i compare it to like a talking heads album or the really good um uh almost like art rock that yeah. we covered um a little bit like the grace jones album we covered last week too that it, yeah, it jumped around point. all over the place mm -hmm. uh night clubbing for those that may not listen last week but uh it flies by nine tracks and even though the length of it is longer than you'd think it, it's one of those albums that i saw the length i'm like there's no way that album could have been that long because it felt like it flew by um yeah for american listeners probably the biggest hit would be here comes the rain again yeah, uh that one's track. played yeah mm -hmm. that one was is played to this day all the time um and has a an undeniable layered chorus that's fantastic but i mentioned before that the first cut is a super duper funky song um number two is a very electronic song i'd say with starts it's i'd say that's the one that's almost the most like a kraut rock song I'd say. Um, You're saying Regrets, the second track? Yeah, Regrets, the second mm -hmm. track. Yeah. yeah. Um, right, by your, um, right By Your Side um, is uh, kind of sounds at times like Don't Come Around Here No More by Tom Petty, mm -hmm. uh, the guitar riff, uh, before it goes into the, you know, the part right before it goes into the give it up, stop part. Like, that's like what the guitar sounds like. Mm -hmm. Um Cool Blue is a more delicate song that sounds at times like a little... I'm trying for people that have, haven't listened, but it's got sort of the, the drum and bass of early hip-hop or like the early Madonna album, right? Like a, a yes. stripped-down uh, sound that way. Uh, probably the second biggest hit on this album is Who's That Girl, the fifth track. Um, and that's a very cool song where Annie Lennox sort of sings like Sade, um is is her vocal styling on that one so that should mm -hmm. give you an idea just on the first five um tracks for those that might be looking for hallmarks of what it sounds like um that's what you're looking for but yeah to me this is one of the higher quality top shelf versions of synth rock because there's yep. a humanness to it that sometimes i feel like synth rock loses for me that it balances the best of what synth rock gives with the the dance the danceability sort of like the alluring coldness yep. but with um but with a humanness to it and that that's why it has a little bit of like what the new romantic spring too and that's why another thing i think it sounds a little bit like is roxy music but mm -hmm. like a synth version of roxy music so 
uh, yeah, this one is definitely a recommend for me. Strong recommend. I enjoyed this album quite a bit. Yeah, uh, strong recommend for me too. Any coldness that comes that may come through in the music is immediately cut by oh, yeah. Annie Lennox's voice, and that kind yeah, of I, adds that emotion and human element to it. Yeah, I didn't but, find this album cold, and I yeah, that I is the either. the number one thing I say sometimes with synth rock is like it's like the the the, the uh, frigid scale for me from right. frigid to like surprisingly warm this falls in the surprisingly warm scale yeah. of that for synth rock so yeah it is it is a very like warm sound um it's in it's very alluring in some ways and yeah i i felt like the album flew by as well for being 40 